if you had an ability to be able to remotely perceive stuff any place in the world, that could be an extraordinary intelligence source. We found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations. Are you saying that the work you've been doing is classified? It was a research facility. That was all that we were going to tell them. The Russians have been spending millions of dollars investigating so-called ESP. Psychic spies. Almost a psychic arms race here. Is there any real application to this? I think remote viewing has been demonstrated over the 20 years of work that's been sponsored by the government. Producing crucial and vital intelligence to the NSA, CIA, DEA, and the Secret Service. I began to feel frightened. The KGB did it, man. What's really going on here? State-sponsored assassination attempt. The CIA was lying. They wanted to kill the program. A storm brewing. This is real. I say no more secrets. Let this information out. Hi guys and welcome to another edition of The Kevin Moore Show. Now on today's show I'm about to be joined by my two guests, Russell Targ and Lance Mongria. Now Russell is a physicist, author and was a pioneer in the development of the laser and laser applications. Now he was also co-founder of the previously secret Stanford Research Institute investigation into psychic abilities during the 1970s and 80s. Now his work in this new area, called Remote Viewing, was published in magazines like Nature and the Proceedings of the Institute of the Electrical and Electronic Engineers and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Now Russell did graduate work in physics at Columbia University and is co-author of six books dealing with the scientific investigation of psychic abilities. Now, in 1997, he retired from Lockheed Martin Missile and Space Co. as a senior staff scientist. Now, today I'm also joined with director and filmmaker of The Third Eye Spies, Lance Mongria. Now, The Third Eye Spies is a new documentary film rising in the ranks about the experiments with remote viewing. Produced by Russell Targ, this film drives into the depths of the CIA and how the US military was involved with remote viewing and more. So Russell Targ and Lance Mongria, welcome to the show. Thank I'm happy to be with you this morning. Great to have you both on, great to have you both on. Now this is to discuss, um, Lance, your latest movie, which is Third Eye Spies, which obviously uh, Russell is a participant in that, um, what would you call it, a documentary or, or a movie? Well, I, I would call it uh, a documentary feature film. I mean, it's a it's a you know almost two hour feature film, which Russell not only uh, you know d details not only Russell's history and uh, the rest of the folks at SRI, who Stanford Research Institute, who uh, really spearheaded the use of psychic abilities for the U.S. government from the 1970s to the 90s. Uh, but uh, Russell also is uh, you know my my producer on the film as well. So uh, you know Russell and I is, is this has been a very long journey, you know, culminating in the, in this film uh, over the last, uh, you know, almost five years now. Wow, I bet it has. I bet I can see some of your camera equipment in the background as well. So, um, so you've worked on other documentaries, and and this was what what really pulled you to want to do this documentary then? Um, Go ahead. <laughs> well, well, for for me, um, I've always been sort of um, interested in you know, psychic abilities and in, and sort of um, had enough of my own, you know, paranormal experiences personally over the years. 
uh, where I, I think I went through several phases in my life where I kind of pushed that kind of stuff away because I had no reference points and I didn't really understand it. And um, when Russell came in, you know, and, and Russell had seen a previous film that I did, um, by that point in my life, I had already sort of been on my own um, sort of journey of discovery, I guess you could say, where I was reading a lot and I was, uh, you know, um, I'd taken up a meditation practice. And so I was really ready to meet Russ when when he sort of saw a film of mine that I had done, uh, you know, Six String Samurai, which was my first feature film, which was a uh, action film, actually. And uh, and, you know, he, he called me up, actually, through a mutual friend and and um that led to us getting together and meeting in Los Angeles. And, and, uh, I was blown away by when Russ shows up at my door with, with a, uh, big briefcase, just chock full of documents that are marked like, you know, uh, classified or, you know, scratched out and, uh, you know, released recently by CIA. And, and, uh, that really blew me away. I mean, because I really had absolutely no idea of the true extent uh, of what had been done in the area of psychic research and, operational use of um, what later became known as remote viewing, uh, which is basically you're using only the power of your own mind to reach out and see objects or people or places that are otherwise completely hidden. Uh, and, uh, you know, the folks at SRI, Russell Targan and his partner Hal Putoff, uh, and a psychic by the name of Ingo Swan, um, who claimed at the time to be the greatest psychic in the world, basically pioneered this technique in the modern era. So um, that I found really fascinating because the results they got were incredible. And what really drove me, though, to make the film was this idea that we're a lot more than just what we think we are. You know, that it, it, what it said to me about human potential was really the thing that, that drove me, uh, even through a lot of lonely hours in the editing room, many, many months of, of editing and, and uh you know, Russell being very patient as I as I tried to sort of tried to piece this together into something that I think really reflected how I felt about the the subject matter. You know, because I came in actually with a very kind of open mind, but also very skeptically, and I wanted to make sure that we conveyed the body of evidence uh, th that was being presented because it was just overwhelming. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, um, yes, and uh, with yourself then. Um, with yourself, uh, Russell, uh, how I know you've been on many other talk shows, and you know you, you you've covered a lot of the sort of background into your work as well. I've, I've heard you on Coast to Coast before, and, and, and many others. Um, I, I suppose let's just sort of dive really into the consciousness side here of of how this works and why it works. And um, w what is your take on that? How, how are we? How are some people able to able to have this gift of of remote viewing? And is it, do, do we all have that ability as well? Where, where are we tapping into to get that information from? I think that we all have psychic abilities. Some people have more than others. It's like a musical ability that is in the 1930s. Every household had a piano and every well brought up young woman could sit and play the piano. And uh, that wouldn't necessarily get her to Carnegie Hall, but it's an ability that everyone has. And psychic abilities are really like that. If I do a workshop, I expect everybody in the workshop to either do something psychic or see something psychic. In making this film, I was eager to make the film because the CIA has always threatened to make things secret again. So there's a little window when our 20 years of miracles from Stanford Research Institute became available. I had the documents. Uh, they were finally declassified, more or less, and I wanted to record the remarkable things that we had done for two decades before they disappeared again. There's sort of ups and downs of psychic ability. Uh, ESP appears and disappears in the consciousness of people, and we had excellent records of finding downed airplanes, hidden hostages, kidnapped people, so forth, and I had the documents, I was there, so I could give a first-person testimony of what it was like to sit with somebody as they were locating a hidden airplane, and I wanted to get that on film uh, while it was still possible. Well, let me ask you this then, how many years did you work for the CIA then? I, I worked for the CIA for 10 years. 
I started the program with Hal Putoff in 1972, and I worked for a decade. At the end of my decade, the program was so successful that our reward was we could no longer publish anything at all. So I went to graduate school and got a degree in physics, but I didn't go to school to become a psychic spy for the CIA. That, that was not my uh, professional objective. I was very interested in understanding how uh, ESP works as a scientist and as a person who had experienced a lot of psychic events. I was eager to try and find a model to record and publish what that it looks like. And we did publish it in Nature magazine and the Proceedings of the Engineering Society. So I was very happy to write books about that and get it published in prestigious journals. But then they slammed the door shut. They said, you've done such a good job, we can't let you publish anything anymore. And that was my key to leave the program. So are there some parts of the program you, you haven't talked about as well? I can now talk about everything that I was involved in. The program went on for another 15 years under the direction of Ed May, who is another physicist. And that was also very operational. That I know that they were even working with the uh, looking for narcotics and prisoners who escaped and all sorts of other things that I was not involved in. But I, I've heard that those were very successful, but I can't give firsthand testimony. What I can give testimony for is experiences where we were prowling through the Kremlin looking for Brezhnev's office or finding missing American hostages and things like that. I, I spent a decade as a um, psychic spy together with the great psychics we were working with. So I can give you first. Per I can give you first-person testimony of what it's like to sit in a little room and look for something that we were told to try and find. Have you signed a secrecy act? Have you signed an act where you cannot talk? Where, where you cannot talk about some things? Then have you signed a sec? Uh, yeah, like, what are they oh, called? No, no, there's, there's no limit. I can tell you. I'm to a point now in my life where I can tell you anything I want to. Any anything I know, I can tell you. I'm not. I'm not limited by anything. No, but I mean, back the, in back in the day, did you sign? Did you sign a secrecy act? Did you have to sign oh, something? Oh, I certainly signed a secrecy. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I had a top secret. I had a top secret clearance. Yeah. And I couldn't talk about anything. Well, that's not quite true. We had an agreement with the director of the CIA, John McMahon, where half of our time would be spent trying to understand this and the other half would be operational and of course we couldn't publish operational stuff where we were looking for hostages and prisoners and things but we could publish uh, psychic hide and go seek in the San Francisco Bay Area where hell would hide and we would try and find him and so that half of our work or part of our work was unclassified so the world knew that there was something like remote viewing going on at SRI, and we could tell them in quite a lot of detail what we were doing in the experimental part, and there was a secret part off to the side which we, of course, could not talk about. Of course, of course. And um, do, do you feel that the program's still running? Do you, do you feel that uh, governments around the world are still using remote viewers? Well, in the film, we talked to Kit Green, who was our contract monitor. In fact, the remarkable thing about our film is that we have the two CIA operators, Kit Green, who is a physician, and Ken Kress, who is a physicist. They're on camera saying, yes, we were polygraphed, and what Targ said in this film really happened. We were there, and this is what happened. So that's a great good fortune to have the contract monitors on camera making this film with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, w w how, how accurate was the program, would you say, in general? I would say in my, I was, I just met with Jacques Vallée yesterday, who's the great uh, UFO investigator, and he said, the, the material that you have here, the material you've published and showing your film, didn't, didn't you make mistakes? And I say, well, during the decade I was there, uh, we had very great success. Of course, 
we were playing psychic hide and go seek. Pat Price was trying to do, Pat Price was the retired police commissioner, is one of the most psychic people we ever knew. Each day for nine days, he had to describe what it looks like where my partner, Hal Putoff, was hiding in some random location that I didn't know. And in seven of those nine cases, he gave a description good enough so the judge, who's a psychologist, was able to match that first place match. So what that means is that in nine trials, if Putoff was kidnapped nine days in a row, we would have found him the first place we looked. So, no, we were not perfect, but we would have found the missing kidnap victim seven out of nine times, and everyone thought that was pretty good. I wonder, you know, it's funny, um, obviously, uh, I, I watch a lot of documentaries, and one of the new documentaries on Netflix is about Madeleine McCann. And uh, I, I wonder, um, have you ever heard of the case of Madeleine McCann, the missing young girl in Portugal? I, I don't know that. No, no. Well, when we talk about missing persons, I mean, how old can you go back to? If you want to do a, a remote viewing for someone, how old does the, can you go back to a crime scene? Does it matter in, in this, the sense of time, if it happened years ago? The um, missing persons, the kidnapped victims that we were after were all contemporan contemporaneous. We, we were asked to describe uh, a picture. We're, we're given a picture by the chief of naval operations. Here, here's an envelope. Can you, what can you tell us about the, the guy in the envelope? And the psychic said, well, this man is very sick. It looks like he's dying. He's in a dark place. He can hardly move. Wait, wait, I see him coming into the light. And that turned out to be Richard Queen, who is the ambassador to Iran, one of the hostages. So he was, in fact, in the dark. We didn't know where he was, but we had an old picture of him. And the word was out that he was very sick. So he wanted to know, could we tell him? And in fact, uh, our psychic said he'll be released in a couple of days. And in fact, two days later, he was released and the Air Force took him to Augsburg in Germany to a hospital. So we were able to describe the, we had no idea who he was or where he was. Question is, what can you tell us about the guy in the envelope? And Joe McMonagle, Joe McMonagle who's one of our great psychics, who is a uh, Army officer, who is one of the lead people, the Army Psychic Corps that we helped create, uh, he was able to describe where General Dozier had been kidnapped to. Jo Dozier was an American general in Italy, and the Red Brigade snatched him from Venice and took him to Padua. And everyone was very upset because he was being held as a hostage by the Red Brigade. Uh, Joe McMonagall described what it looked like where he was. And in the process of his description, he said, I actually know where that is. I recognize that. that he's in Padua because I recognize the hotel on the corner of the wharf. And that's, in fact, where he was. General Dozier had been kidnapped to that hotel, and Joe could identify the very spot with his psychic ability. I actually... I actually have like something to add to that story. Um, I, I just the other day uh, was going through some of the CIA uh, Freedom of Information Act materials, and I found a very interesting document that I had never found before, uh, which was basically a report <clears throat> given by SRI and another consultant uh, in, uh, I think that was like 1984 or something. It was like uh, dated like December 15, 1984 or something like that. Uh, and uh, SRI had been asked, is there anything that needs to be on uh, that's going to happen of significance, uh, you know, um, to the country in the next two weeks? And um, Hal put off then sent back a report through another consultant that was outside of SRI uh, saying in uh, three days, uh, they, they gave a specific date, which is very rare. Um, in three days, uh, a high ranking person in the Pentagon is going to be kidnapped and uh they said on the evening of this third day and then that was the day that dozier the person that that russell is talking about was actually kidnapped wow. you know in the evening yeah. uh of that third day uh from uh i think it was yeah, yeah in uh italy so um 
you know, that was pretty incredible to me that that uh, you could do that. Oh yeah, no, it's absolutely fascinating stuff. No, when I mentioned about Madeleine McCann or missing people in general, I mean, if they're deceased, can a remote viewer still go back to that that time and and try to remote view what actually happened? Um, I think it's I think it's actually easier for remote viewers to see things in the past and the future. It's much actually, I think, more difficult uh, to stay exactly centered in the present moment because. Uh, the the way your consciousness works, it's not linear, uh, and and there's examples of uh, you know remote viewers seeing things uh, that that were described far in the past or even uh, you know precognitively in the future, and and them not realizing that that's what they were looking at, you know, uh, because it's very hard to say look at nine o'clock a.m. tomorrow morning. I mean that that example I just gave you is actually very rare. Sure. So it's actually I think just as easy to see the past or the future as it is to see the present. Yeah. No. I mean. Um... Thank you for that. Absolutely. And when when viewing the future, um, there must have been some amazing examples of um, information that came your way that uh, maybe um, um, Russell, you, you you sort of still look back at now and think, you know, is that a possibility? Could that happen? I mean, I you know, I'm just presuming that being around these great remote viewers, that uh, you know, they they maybe you know saw things you know in in, in, a, in potential future sometimes. Well, we haven't gone very far in the future. For experiments have been done by uh, Robert John at Princeton. The most interesting thing that we know about psychic ability is that it's a non-local ability. That is, you can see into the distance and you can see into the future. And what's interesting about that is that as you go further and further into the distance, there's no degradation of the ability. The accuracy and reliability is unaffected by going further and further. In fact, there's a famous case where Ingo Swan was asked to describe what's going on at Jupiter. We had a contract with NASA, and the NASA guys were in my office with Ingo and turned to him and said, well, we're launching a Pioneer spacecraft to Jupiter. We're going to find there anything there when we get there. And Ingo said, well, let me take a look at Jupiter. So he sat back and puffed a big cigar and said, well, Jupiter is surrounded by a big ring of ice crystals, which I'd never noticed before. And my contract monitor said, well, you must be looking at Saturn. Saturn is the one with the ring. And Ingo said, give me a break. I've been looking at the solar system for 50 years. I know the difference between Jupiter and Saturn. You asked me about Jupiter, and there's this big ring of crystals, and he drew that, and we showed that in the film. And eight months later, the Pioneer spacecraft got to Jupiter, and in fact, NASA shows the ring of ice crystals around the planet. And no one had ever seen that before. And that's 500 million miles away, and it's uh, 60 light minutes away. So if Ingo said, let me look at Jupiter, it would take him an hour for the light from Jupiter to get to him, but it didn't take him any, any time at all. And uh, the, the Buddhists have the idea that there is no separation in consciousness. If you want to see Jupiter, Jupiter is available to you right now. And our data supports that, that you can look anywhere you want to look and it doesn't take any time you can look into the future, and that's just as easy as doing contemporaneous remote viewing. So your psychic ability is accurate, independent of space and time. So it's a non-local ability, which is very coherent with modern physics. The idea of entanglement and non-local connections is the most interesting thing going on in physics. So we're not violating, we're not violating physics and in fact, in the film, we interview Brian Josephson, and he said, no physics was harmed in this film, <laughs> although some physicists might be. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, well, what does it say about the nature of, of reality then? I mean, it, in a sense, right, if someone's able to remote view, right, why, why is that gift so different then to a medium or psychic or channeler in a sense? I, mean, I, know, I know that... We, they're all they're all different labels, and they all mean something different in a sense. But aren't they all tapping into the same, um, the same source, the same strings in a sense? 
Yes, I think that we all have that ability. In America, it's more difficult than in other places because it's forbidden to have psychic abilities in America. In other countries like Iceland or uh, Brazil, of course, even the Soviet Union and Holland, if a little Icelander tells his mother, uh, I, I think grandma's coming, I see, I see her leaving her house in Reykjavik, coming to our house, the mother will start setting the table for the arrival of grandma. In America, they would say, don't, don't talk nonsense. Uh, grandma's 10 miles away, she's not coming. It's so in many countries, Iceland in particular, where I've been numerous times, psychic ability is part of the belief system, part of everyday activity. In Brazil, we had a conference and I was staying with an attorney said, how could you have a conference on something as ordinary as ESP? We just see that every day. So, but in, but in America, there's great pressure on not doing that. We're still suffering from the so-called enlightenment when the scientists got rid of anything that looked at all mystical because they were just recovering from domin domination by the church. So they didn't want to be attached to anything that looked church-like. I think that uh, I, I think that the the real um, issue here is is this idea of belief systems and sort of like uh, our own filters that we have uh, as a culture, uh, biases that we may have. And I think that when you talk about a channeler or you talk about a medium or you talk about a remote viewer, yes, they're all tapping into the same ability. But it just depends on what filters that they're they're choosing to use. You know, um, a medium or a channeler may be completely using that to get out of their own way, uh, and then connect with some sort of higher source that that allows them to pull in the information, uh, and it, and it's being filtered through their own imagination. It's a very imaginary skill. It's like it forces you to have to use your imagination, uh, and then not completely discount the weird, unexpected things that come to your mind. Um, remote viewing is is just more of a sort of a scientific method of, of doing very much the same sort of thing without the the extra you know um, stuff attached to it uh, you know Joe McMonagle told me that uh, who was one of the army's best remote viewers who's in third eye spies our film uh, you know he won the Legion of Merit award for you know many many uh, cases of uh, you know solved through remote viewing uh, which is the highest honor you can get as a non-combatant uh, member of the intelligence community. And he said he does a lot of his remote viewing now when he's working for corporations and things like that while he's watching Jeopardy in the evening. And and uh, a commercial will come on and he'll just kind of reach over and he'll scribble some stuff down on a pad and then he'll go back to watching his show. So because he's been doing it so long and he's managed to remove a lot of the filters and sort of creative blocks that he may have otherwise. Whereas um, I think that uh, you know, it's a fundamental thing, and, and you can call it a lot of different things, but it seems like we're all just tapping into the same place. But but do you think a remote viewer like Ingo Swan and some of the other greats, do you think they are naturally gifted in that arena? Do you think they, that they're more open to something or they're more connected to something? I call it something because, you know, we're talking about something beyond the veil, isn't it, in a sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that... Um, a lot of the people that SRI worked with, and I was actually really, this is one of the most surprising things I found as a filmmaker working on this, uh, is that they were not already psychics. Ingo was actually the one exception uh, to the rule. You know, he, he was probably one of the only sort of already working psychics that kind of like led the way in this because he was sort of the father of remote viewing in the modern era. You know, he coined the phrase, you know, he was sitting in the lab and they were having him do these kind of Gonsfeld, you know, card tricks, uh, guess what's in the envelope. And he said, this is boring. You know, if you really want me to do something, I can look anywhere on the planet, give me something better to do, because he was already experienced at it. But once they sort of caught on to the fact that that was possible, um, SRI's funding was not so extreme that they could go out and, you know, work with the, the biggest psychics in the world. And in fact, they found when they tested people who were already psychic, uh, they already had their own kind of belief system set. They already had a certain way of doing things that made it a lot harder uh, to get them to do remote viewing. Because they, uh, but when it came to sort of, uh, you know, they would be looking for a subject and they pull the scientist in from the next lab, and then he's doing a better job than the professional psychics are. You know, um, and so I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that you had these guys walking around in lab coats. Uh, in, in this very prestigious laboratory. Stanford Research Institute is one of the biggest scientific laboratories in the world that does primarily 
government work. And they would basically just say, today, you're going to be psychic. And, you know, sit down, we're going to work with you. And, and they would do the same thing when dignitaries would come. A lot of times, um, they would get high-ranking government officials who would be very skeptical and would show up at SRI basically saying, uh, you know, we think you're wasting our money and, and this is a big joke and, uh, you know, you better show us something really good right now or we're going to cancel your program. And they would just say, okay, you're going to be the remote viewer today. You sit down in the chair. And I heard stories after stories after stories of, uh, you know, people like, um, you know, Senator uh, Claiborne Pell, you know, for example, like, you know, who, would, who came in and sat down and said, you know, this is ridiculous. And, and they sent his attache to go hide. And, um, and he said, I can't do this. This is, this is utterly nonsense. And they said, just close your eyes and tell us what the most unexpected images that come to your mind are when, you're, when your uh, assistant is hiding. And he said, I just can't do it. And they said, then imagine it. Just use your imagination. And so he closes his eyes and he, and, he, and he says, oh, okay, I see him standing in front of a fountain and there's these little kids playing around the fountain and it's really hot. So he decides that he's going to take his shoes off and he's going to uh, stick his feet in the and sit there and watch these kids. And, oh, look at that. He fell in. Oh, he got his nice suit all wet. How funny. And, and, uh, and he was making it up. But then the guy comes walking back into the lab you know, 20, 30 minutes later and he's covered in water. <laughs> because he fell into a fountain, you know, so it's it's like stories like that really demonstrate how much we sort of um, objectify something like uh, psychic ability. And we say it's only for the very few or it's the the professional psychics that can do this. And And like Russell said, you know, maybe some people are a lot better at it than others. But um, I think we actually tend to discount it so much that it winds up sort of being almost a reverse side where, where we, we sort of trick ourselves out of thinking that we're psychic. Everything you said is true, but there is a continuum. You have people like Ingo Swan and Pat Price who are in a, cat in a class by themselves. Pat Price was able to read secret documents hidden in a vault at the NSA facility that caused a great hubbub between CIA and NSA NSA was very angry with the CIA. Why did you have your guy from California? Why, why are you having psychics reading our top secret documents? So Price is really the only person who could do that. And he was a psychic all of his life. Now there were, at, so we're working with these great natural psychics, Ingo Swan and Pat Price, who are really astonishing in their accuracy. And the CIA said, well, we want to see a control subject. Can't you bring in someone who had never done this before? And I invited my good friend, Hella Hammett, who is a professional photographer, um, linguist, very intelligent, capable woman. And she thought it would be entertaining to leave her L.A. practice and come and be a psychic for the CIA on an occasional basis. And in formal trials, this looking psychic hide and go seek as we did with Pat Price, Hella was actually more significant than the most psychic man in the world. And that astonished everybody and changed the whole view of the CIA in particular as to who's going to be psychic because this nice stylish lady comes in and is remarkably successful at describing where the CIA guy is hiding. He feels uh, I'm CIA, I'm going to hide in some really cool place, you'll never find me. And day after day, she described just what it looked like where she was. And that changed the whole idea of, as Lance said, whole idea about who's a psychic. And we then were asked to choose six army officers from Fort Meade in Maryland to create an army psychic corps. And of those six people that we chose, Four of them turned out to be outstanding psychics. So there, there, there is a just, and one of them was Joe McMonagall, who again is a, in a class by himself. So it's one of the things we say there were there were four psychics, all of whom did statistically significant descriptions of distant places. And I know the statistical significance doesn't excite everybody the way it might a scientist, but Joe could describe things on and on in very great detail and has 20 years later still become one of the most outstanding psychics in the world. Yeah, and uh, when I asked earlier on, do you think the program is still going forward? Do you think there are still, you know, the government still has 
you know th this at its uh, at its at its hands to use um, for a foreign intelligence collection and, and, and as such. Do you do you believe that there are remote viewers still working with the government? Well, it would be reasonable for the government to continue doing this since we were able to find hostages and downed airplanes and all sorts of things. Be it wouldn't make any sense for it to go away. And in fact, on camera, we asked. Uh, Lance asked Kit Green, do you think it's still going on? And Green said, of course, it's still going on. Uh, I've talked to the uh, director of intelligence, and he said it's still going on, probably at a lower level at the CIA. I trained two CIA, two CIA operatives came to SRI to see what we're doing, and I trained them how to do remote viewing. And, and Training how to do remote viewing is not a big deal. It means we spend a couple of days learning the moves, and then if they're talented, they can go and do that. So they went back to the CIA, and eventually Pat Price, the great psychic, was so successful at describing uh, Russian weapons factories and, CIA and NSA facilities that the CIA was uncomfortable with this phenomenal Superman hanging out with the hippies in California. They said, we, we, this guy is just, he could reach launch codes in the president's pocket, nuclear launch codes. We got to get him out of California into safekeeping. So they brought him to Virginia to be a contractor directly for the CIA. And we were told on camera that Price was working with the two people that I trained at the CIA in that period. And I, I, I want to, you know, this was a question that I asked literally everybody that I, I interviewed, you know, because it was uh, really sort of boggling to me that you could get the kind of results that SRI got and then do anything but keep doing it, you know, because, uh, and not just at SRI, but they, they got the same results at Duke, at, at Princeton. Uh, there was an army program that's very well documented that Russell and Hal be began for the army and then was taken over by defense intelligence. And they all got similar results. So, so it's not a question of whether or not it works. There's still a big question of how it works or why it works, or you know, or what the the mechanism is. And I have my own opinions about that. But, but the the issue was really why would they cancel something that was so useful? And of course, you know, there were a lot of leaks coming out of the army program. You know, because um, you had a lot of guys who were not career operators the way you would be if you were an undercover intelligence agent. These were army grunts who who um, had sort of been trained into remote viewing, and then they eventually got out of the army, and they wanted to talk about it. They wanted to write books. Uh, and and defense intelligence basically said, we're just going to ignore these guys uh, and um, let them sound crazy, you know, because we don't want to confirm that we have a program. And by, you know, condemning them, we would, you know, have a reverse effect. So what wound up eventually happening um, was... You know, government's not a monolithic thing. You know, you, the intelligence community even is not a monolithic thing. There's competing agendas, there's competing programs, and, and it's purposefully kept very stovepiped, very separate, you know, so, so that the left hand purposefully does not know what the right hand is doing. So what I found through a series of a lot of interviews with people, I mean, we interviewed over, you know, probably 50, 60 people in total, and not all of those people made it to the film, um, you know, is that... You had a lot of animosity between CIA and the Army, um, and the CIA was very much publicly denigrating the Army program. Um, but at the same time, it was very confusing to me because they were using it, you know, a lot. You know, uh, they were one of the the uh, Army's best customers, basically. And and so, why would they do that? And and uh, and then also at the same time, you've had reports of other agencies within the intelligence agency developing their own remote viewing programs, and and. Uh, I think that those are just speculative. You know, I can't prove that, but it would make a lot of sense because it's so easy to do. You could literally have a book club on Friday nights and, uh, you know, but nobody else has the resources of the U.S. government to go and verify the information that you're getting. You know, you and I can talk about Soviet weapons factories, but we're not going to be able to confirm that. The government can, so they know if they are onto something or not. So I think that that what happened was you had sort of the army program, which was the last sort of real surviving government program, sort of strangled um, by CIA and, and, and some other agencies. 
And when you talk to the really public guys that had done this, like Lynn Buchanan or Joe McMonagall or uh, some of the real big army room viewers that have now written a lot of books about this, um, they all say, oh, I think it just ended. Uh, you know, and, and that may have been the case for their program because their program and Russell's, uh, you know, work at SRI was highly overseen by the by the highest levels of government. I mean, and, and this was another thing that really got me to do the film because I understood that we were being backed up by a lot of evidence at high levels uh, of declassified documents. You know, there was uh, House Intelligence Committee hearings about this. There was uh, cabinets of the presidents being briefed. The presidents themselves talked about this. So... Uh, that's actually a very public top secret program that, that provided a lot of leaks. So if I'm sitting in CIA or, or some other government agency that is using this, I'm really upset about that. And I'm thinking about how all of this information is just flying out into the world. So what's the best way to basically kill all those leaks? Well, you you destroy the credibility of, of the existing programs. Um, you move the really good but not very public people very much underground, you know, in, in doing this. And then you um, publicly do a big report that it never worked, which is what they did in 1995. They said, oh, this was something that we played with. It didn't work. Uh, so we canceled it. And and um, then you go back to working with um, consultants and small contractors like the way that it started with SRI, where there is no oversight. You know, there there is no um, congressional reports. There's no uh, multi-million or billion-dollar uh, budgets out in the open. It's so dark that that you don't have to report it out because you know, it's a very small expenditure. You know, the only reason they were reporting it out was because Russell and Hal um, had already had so many connections in government before the remote viewing program through their work in uh, laser research uh, for CIA and NASA and other agencies, that it started up the chain of command and it took several years to really build the trust within the high levels of government uh, to really support this. And they had real allies, but they also had a lot of enemies. You know, they, they had a lot of uh, career politicians, military generals, uh, people like that who simply could not wrap their head around the concept of remote viewing, you know, um, mainly because of uh, actually... Uh, religious dogma. Well, of you course. know the fact that this this did not, you know, uh, compute with well, yeah. their worldview. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, wh where does the um, the sort of the science now stand with uh, what well, open-minded science stand stand? Shall I say with remote viewing? I mean, are we are we at a point where science could even you know entertain that there's um, it's a possibility? Well, science is very interested in this because what we see is that remote viewing is a non-local ability, independent of distance and time. And there are many things that are independent of distance and time. Whenever you have a non-local coordinate system, um, modern physics can describe how that, what that coordinate system looks like. That is, in the very... Einstein has such a coordinate system to describe relativity, where part of it is imaginary and part is real. So physicists are really quite familiar with looking at surprising, unusual, and very useful other ways of measuring space and time. And this, this is not a, this, I should say that psychic abilities are not new age. This has been discussed in detail for thousands of years. The fellow looking over my shoulder here with the shawl over his, that's Padma Sambhava, who brought Buddhism from India to Tibet. And he said that our ability, our nature is timeless awareness. What he meant by that is that when you quiet your mind, you can see into the distance, see into the future, and your nature is independent of time and space and is even independent of cause and effect which is quite shocking to physicists. But you have to think that if your consciousness allows experience what's going on in the future, then you can have your experience affected by something at a later time. And people have that experience all the time. The most, the most common psychic experience that people have is a precognitive dream, where I dream tonight uh, there's an elephant in my garden, and that's certainly quite crazy. And I would tell my wife that I had this crazy dream. And then tomorrow, 
I look out, and there's this, there's this elephant that escaped from the circus that came to town. So I would say that Monday night's dream was caused by Tuesday morning's elephant. It's retrocausal, and the idea, idea of this kind of retrocausality is very common. That is the most common, most common ESP or psychic experience that a person has is a precognitive dream, and this was described in detail 1,200 years ago by Padma Sambhava and described in pretty great detail 400 years before Christ by Patanjali, who is a great uh, Hindu teacher, where he said, on, on your quest toward experiencing the divine, as you quiet your mind, if you're successful in quieting your mind, you'll be able to see into the distance see into the future, diagnose illness, and heal the sick. Mm -hmm. And in the Sutra of the Patanjali, still available at your bookstore, you can learn how to do that. Well, isn't so that... this is not, not a new age idea. No, no, no. But, but you know, what, what you're saying there just, just brings the images of uh, Edgar, Edgar Cayce into my head. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, but, uh, I, you know, I, he would never have viewed it as a remote view. And he, he talked about... Um, Oh, what did he say? It was it was like he was going. He was he went to. He, he was he was viewing the Akashic records. The Akashic records. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah the Akashic yeah. records. Yes. And, yeah, uh, he, he, and and I think that what this all comes down to, all of it, like all of the phenomenon that we talk about, uh, the phenomenon that you often talk about so well on your show with with so many great guests, uh, is it all boils down to one word, which is consciousness. Uh, you know, is the power of our own consciousness and the ability to tap into something larger, which may be sort of akin to kind of like a cosmic internet, uh, that, that, that basically we have access to all information in space and time, all possibilities, and, and uh, we're able to pull that down. And that's been sort of living for thousands of years only in the realm of the mystics and, and in people like Edgar Cayce and today people like Lee Carroll and, uh, and, and people like that who are channelers. But um, to me, and the thing that was the most interesting about making this film, um, and and really to really answer the question that you you asked about why isn't scientists uh, science itself taking this seriously? What does this do to science? Is that we as a as a culture um, are very splintered in our in our belief systems about really what science is, and and science has actually become very dogmatic in a lot of ways um, because a, a nuclear physicist is not going to study what a um, molecular biologist is doing. You know, and and so um, a lot of the mainstream science has not looked at the data that has come out of places like SRI uh, and and sort of taken it seriously. It's sort of just discounted out of hand because it's not convenient, and um, and it doesn't fit within people's model. And there's been a stigma uh, that is built up around the subject matter because it is treated like mysticism or like something that is far out when it really isn't. You know, it it does sort of it can fit within the existing models to a certain extent. But you can't pin down consciousness. You know, it's not gonna. There's not a mechanism that I can point to and say, "This is why this works," and and uh, and it doesn't work every time. And and so why not? And and the and the issue really comes down to you because you, as the observer, are participating in any experiment or any work that's being done, uh, and your own sort of biases and feelings about it um, actually affect the outcome if you're trying to do it. You know, so it's not a switch that you just turn on. And, and science likes switches. They like to be able to develop a working hypothesis about how something works. And, and uh, if, until you can come up with a theory, uh, you know, uh, mainstream science won't really embrace this. It, but for the same reasons that, that um, Galileo, you know, can set a telescope out in the streets of, of uh, you know, where he lives and then invite people to look into it. And they won't because they don't want to upset their worldview. Well, ab absolutely. And, let, and I know we're getting to the end of this interview. Let, let me ask you this then as well. I mean, um, obviously, I, I think remote viewers, I'm, 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 hope, I'm not wrong to say this, have remote viewed the edges in a sense. Like, you know, have they gone into what conscious, have, have they tried to remote view, um, you know, consciousness? If, you, if that's just even something they even looked at doing, have they remote mm. viewed um, other galaxies? Have they remote viewed, you know, beyond the unknown in a sense? Have they tried try to go in, into the unknown uh, with, with remote viewing? Well, the furthest that I know about is the experiment that I did with Ingo Swan, where he was able to instantaneously reach out and describe the rings around Jupiter. We were able to do all sorts of remarkable things. The, our film opens 
with a testimony from Jimmy Carter, where the Russians had crashed an airplane into northern Africa. And it was a very special airplane. It was full of code books with a reconnaissance bomber from the Russians. The CIA could not find it because it was in the jungle. And the satellite photography couldn't penetrate the jungle. And Jimmy Carter's on camera saying, well, we couldn't penetrate the jungle. So the CIA reached out to a psychic in California, which was us. And the psychic here was able to Two of them actually. One described the river where the between the village and the mountains where the thing had crashed, and the other said, "I see it here," and drew a little circle on this map of northern Africa. And the CIA, based on the psychics marking the map, the CIA brought a helicopter into the jungles of Zaire, and it landed just at the place where the natives were dragging metal out of the river. And that metal was the airplane, so that we know that we were there before anybody else. And Jimmy Carter, in his biography, describes his a chapter on clairvoyance. And on a radio broadcast, he described this thing, which partially blew the cover of our program because he named the the code the grill flame name of the secret program. So he, it's the idea that. Who can you trust if you can't trust Jimmy Carter? On the one, and on the other hand, he blew the program the code name by giving a top secret code name on the radio. Yep, thank you for that. Didn't um, have, haven't you come across remote viewers though that have remote viewed um, objects or crafts that should not be in our airspace or should not be on our in in, in, in this um, plan on on this planet i mean ha have ufo's been remote viewed at all i mean and i use that yes. word i use that word ufo very very lightly very lightly yes um there's a lot uh, it seems kind of like everybody uh that that has been involved with this to a certain extent um eventually goes down that road and starts to to think about these other things and this kind of stuff starts to bleed in um, you know, uh, Joe McMonagall is on record having he's not he doesn't speak about it in our film, but he's been on record talking about, um, you know, being asked to review, uh, you know, reconnaissance photos and things like that that had UFOs in them and uh, being asked to describe the propulsion systems and who was in the craft and uh, these kinds of things. And and so, um, you know, this this does come up a lot. There's a lot of contemporary remote viewers that I've spoken with today. Uh, people like Laurie Williams, who runs Intuitive Specialists, um, who is also in our film. Uh, and she's a, a remote viewing instructor. She she has done a lot of tasks uh, involving uh, UFOs and UFO technology, uh, you know, even for uh, clients, and, you know, and things like that. So, um, you know, there, there's if we can sort of see what's going on at, in Jupiter or uh, in your studio today, then why can't we talk to another extraterrestrial culture? I mean, it would make sense um, that maybe we've been sort of wasting our time uh, with radio telescopes and, uh, you know, giant. Uh, dishes trying to, to uh, you know, talk to other planets when in fact it may be just as easy as imagining who you want to talk to and then reaching out. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, you know, I think that you know, when when my community talks about disclosure, you know, it really, you know, it's it's about we should be looking at inner disclosure. You know, I mean, I, I find that all answers lie within. I mean, the whole thing that. You know, okay, so we might be being visited, but I think uh, even they're at a, a higher level of spiritual uh, evolution to be even doing what they're doing. Do you know what I mean? Whoever they are, consciousness is everywhere. Okay, so so it doesn't surprise me that there's life out there. Yeah, but I mean, uh, my main point is, isn't it about inner disclosure as as much as outer disclosure? Yeah, I certainly agree with you. Those we can talk about finding airplanes, forecasting silver that you can use psychic abilities to find your car keys or forecast the market, which we've also done. But my opinion is that the most important thing you can use these abilities for is to discover who you are, to explore the timeless awareness that the great uh, Dharma masters talked to us about, the fact that you can quiet your mind and experience the distance and experience the future. And it's the idea that if you think that who you are is what you see in the mirror in the morning, you, then you're in for a lot of suffering. But if you realize that your nature is timeless awareness, and if you meditate and they allow you to expand your experience of timeless awareness, it gives you a much more freeing and enriched view of who you are. 
It's a, wanna, it's a, it's a oh. more personal application of psychic abilities to discover your own nature. And I want to I want to add to that and say that I, I don't think that we can survive as a culture and as as a planet um, without doing and realizing I think what you're both talking about because we are sort of very cut off. We feel like a victim, you know, like we feel like uh, you know we're alone. And what the evidence suggests when it comes to ESP and remote viewing and these types of phenomenon is that we're really connected fundamentally. And, and that there's uh, still some mystery to the universe, but that um, we're not as sort of alone and, and sort of victims as we think we are. And uh, I don't think that any advanced culture, uh, be they an extraterrestrial culture or a planetary uh, culture here, can survive very long um, without realizing their own potential in terms of their own consciousness. I think that's like the fundamental sort of thing that we need to evolve, to 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 move forward as a planet, because, uh, and and I I just don't buy that you can be a culture uh, that has the ability to destroy itself and then survive very long with the kind of mentality that that we currently have, which is very tribal, and and uh, we need to get over all of that and and sort of be a little more open minded and and to toot our own horn, I think that that's why Third Eye Spies is an important film. You know, it's an important film because it, it allows someone who may not have even thought about this kind of subject matter to take the first step and to um, maybe understand that there's a lot of very serious PhDs and people who have devoted their lives to this subject matter um, and that they have not been taken as seriously as they should because so much of the work became classified and and that that is like a gateway into these much broader questions um, about who we are as human beings, uh, what all of this means, uh, what it means to have extraterrestrial contact. Because if our consciousness uh, is not confined to our own brains, then um, we're like uh, a bunch of uh, heavy metal uh, guitar players uh, droning at 3 a.m. in the morning constantly into the cosmos because we haven't figured out our own inner crap, you know, and uh, because all of that can be heard, you know, on a, on, and we're just broadcasting, you know. So, so I think that, uh, you know, that's why I, I, most of all, I recommend that people watch the film because I also think that consciousness is viral. And the more that a good idea spreads, uh, the easier it is to latch onto. Just like they've proven that through remote viewing, that that uh, the more a target is looked at, or the more you try to hide something, the easier it is to see, you know, and uh, psychically. So, um, you know, that's that's my shameless plug for the film. Really, no, is uh, go uh, see this because I think it's going to help. Uh, well, guys, you, you've done you've done a great uh, documentary here. Uh, it's fa it's really well put together, and I can see why it's gone through uh, mainstream distribution because it's 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 very well done. Um, it's 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 no amateur job. And um, the website for the documentary is uh, you can go to thirdeyespies.com, and uh, from there there's links to either get DVDs. Um, right now that's the only place that you can get DVDs uh, or or Blu-rays, um, as well as. Uh, the film is available worldwide uh, digitally. Um, you know, it's on iTunes. Uh, we, we've been charting in the top 10 on iTunes for the last three weeks. Uh, you, you know, you can get it on um, Google Play, uh, Xbox, uh, any of your cable services worldwide that have video on demand. Uh, it's distributed by The Orchard. So, um, you know, it is it is out, but it still has not been seen by a lot of people. You know, we really need more people to see this film. And if you enjoy the film, please write a review. Uh, you know, tell some friends about it because... We don't have a big marketing budget. We don't have, um, you know, a lot of like official support for this. This is all word of mouth, and and uh, we really need your help to watch this film and and to support it, so that we can continue to have really great conversations about this subject matter because it's really important to have. Absolutely, and if people sign up on your website as well, they'll get um, some more exclusive content. Uh, that's uh, absolutely from, from from yeah. There's th yeah. there's a. If you go to the website, you can get um, a link to my YouTube channel, um, which is either my name, Lance Mungia, M-U-N-G-I-A, uh, or the link is um, Waking Universe TV um, on um, YouTube. And uh, there's, I'm putting up bonus content every few days, um, you know, and I'm continuing to actually cut new material because we have so many hours of additional footage, sure. uh, you know, and interviews that were so great that sure. I just, for time's sake, was not able to put into the film. So we'll be putting a lot of that out on YouTube just to preserve it for the record and so that people can see some of this really great stuff.
Well, I'm glad you're doing that because obviously you can't fit all 50 plus people into a documentary, but it does give you um, uh, people the you, you know um, extra content to have as well, and that and, that, and that's important mm -hmm. because there was so I'm sure there was a lot of great things that were to uh, discussed in in, in this um, in this documentary, and and Russell as well. What would be your most important message to the audience if there was one? Most important message is get in touch with the part of yourself that's psychic. Take take some effort, quiet your mind and look for the surprising images that come into your awareness as you move out into space and time. The, 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 the most important message is there's more to life than the meat and potatoes that you experience. You want to experience your timeless awareness and your, that's your true nature. Yeah. Well, listen, guys, I know this has been um, a really short interview here, and, I, and I, I just so appreciate you guys coming on and uh, just giving me the time uh, right now and um, the inter the uh, trailer has played at the beginning of this uh, um, interview as well and uh, all the links are in the description of this video as well including the links to the iTunes um, um, uh, video and uh, other platforms that it's available on as well so just thank you so very very much to both yourself Russell and yourself Lance thank you for coming on Thank, thank you, you Kevin, and thank you to your audience as well for, for uh, bearing with us and, and, and checking out our film.